So what I'm going to do in the course of the 25 or so minutes is sort of tell a story about what we know climate change, uh, how climate change might affect different insect populations. And you can kind of consider two different things. Uh, you can think about native species, uh, and I know the talks on, on invasive forest pests, but we've seen examples of native species becoming uh, more of a problem, almost acting as an, as an invasive species. Uh, uh, due, to, due to climate change. And we can often consider this in terms of non-native invasive, uh, is that the echo? Uh, non-native invasive forest insects becoming more problematic in the face of climate change. And one thing that can occur, and that does occur, we've seen this occur, is that both situations you can see actually a decline. And we've seen that. We've seen declines in native species. We've even seen decline in species we would otherwise call invasive. So, if you think about this in the context of the biological invasion process, there's usually considered four steps to this process. Species have to get here. Once they get here, they have to establish or not. Most of them actually do not establish, which is very fortunate. Uh, once they are, those that are able to successfully establish, they begin to spread. And the rate at which that occurs has a lot to do with the kind of impacts that they will, 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 will see in the environment. And fortunately, I guess for us, arrival doesn't have a whole lot to do with climate change. Arrival is really driven by this phenomenon, global trade and global travel. travel. Um, these ships are getting bigger. This, this was the biggest ship as, as of last year. Uh, you can see the capacity of one of these cargo ships. Uh, 2.4 million people would be the equivalent of weight if you took that metric ton and converted it to the average weight of a of someone in the U.S. And just to put that in some sort of context, uh, I spent the you know previous 11 plus years or so in Morgantown, West Virginia, working in the research, Northern Research Station with the Forest Service. And think about this ship. There's 1.8 million people in the state of West Virginia. So you could literally put everybody from the state of West Virginia on this boat. And if you notice, you'd have enough room for them to bring their guns. You know, they could really bring that. And uh, I'm glad you guys left. I tell that joke in Seattle, nobody gets it, you know? It's like, <laughs> they don't understand. People in West Virginia own like 40 guns. They don't, they don't get it. So I'm glad you left. I figured you guys would get it. So, uh, but that's a real driver. That's a really driver of, of non-native species importation. Uh, forestry is particularly challenged because of the importance of wood, uh, whether it's live plants or wood products or just good old-fashioned solid wood packing material wood crates, dunnage, and so forth. Um, but the rest of the stages can be, can be influenced by climate change. We could see different rates of establishment, different rates of spread, uh, and, and climate and changes in climate can play a role in that. So I'm going to go through and just give you some examples from the literature, what we know. Of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of known unknowns. There's a lot of unknown unknowns in this arena when we try to link climate change and invasive species. But there's four different areas I want to touch on today. One is climate change and how it's, how it's resulting in changes in distributional ranges. Another one is the degree to which outbreaks are being altered, both in their frequency as well as their intensity. Uh, a third one is how they're changing their seasonality, uh, the timing of the occurrence of different events, and also what we call voltinism, which is just a fancy word for number of generations per year. So the idea that as it gets hotter, some species will be able to develop faster and go through more generations per year. And the last one is a little bit tricky, but I do want to cover it, is this idea of decoupling species interactions. So, a good example of, of climate change, and some of you even, even here might have heard about this, the mountain pine beetle outbreak in uh, British Columbia, uh, which has now spilled into, uh, it's, it's actually past the 60th latitude in British Columbia and has actually crossed the Cascades and is now into Alberta. Uh, these are areas where, this is a good example of a native species, native, it's always gone after lodgepole pine, goes up and down. You can see the time series of, of outbreaks through the, through the years and you can see a pretty good build up here and then a, just a massive build up. I was actually up in northern British Columbia in 2005 at a meeting when it was starting and, or at, towards the peak I should say, and the amount of, uh, dead timber from the flight from Vancouver up to Prince George, which is where I was going, was just incredible. And this is really owed to, to milder winters. 
I know you guys here are saying, what milder winter? Uh, well, some years, uh, we're getting some milder winters. And uh, certainly in, in more recent years, because of these milder winters, it's been able to cross over climatic envelopes that were previously closed. And it's been able to expand quite a bit further. The other big problem in terms of it acting as a, as a non-native species is historically fed on lodgepole pine. So you could make the argument that even though it's going up further north than we think it's been, it's still feeding on lodgepole pine. You know, that's its native host. But what we have seen is that there's a jack pine corridor. Uh, jack pine is in this weird looking shade of, of green. And uh, it's now crossed into jack pine, which is really an evolutionary naive host. So it's, it's a host tree to which it really doesn't have a whole lot of prior evolutionary history. And when insects feed on naive host trees, and emerald ash borer is a good example of that, they tend to do more damage. Emerald ash borer doesn't really do much in China on Manchurian ash but it certainly likes our North American ash pretty well. Most like, much like our bronze birch borer doesn't do a whole lot to our native birch, but it will, it will go to town on, on European birch. So species, insects that are feeding on these naive host plants tend to have an advantage in terms of the damage they can cause. So this is a good example of, of a native species really acting as a, as a non-native species. On that same note, there's a really cool study by Ken Rafa, who's at the other UW, as I say, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he looked at it, uh, once again, the responses of a native host, lodgepole pine, and another naive host, which is a high elevation pine, white bark pine. Uh, once again, it's traditionally been, or historically been at a high enough elevation where mountain pine beetle hasn't been able to really get a foothold until, the, until more recent years in, in response to warmer summer, I'm sorry, warmer winters. And you can see some pretty incredible responses to, to these different host trees when they're attacked. Uh, one thing, example, is how much monoterpenes are, 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 are produced. So, uh, and really take a look at what we call induced. So when plants are eaten by insects, any, any plant is attacked by any insect, it produces what we call induced, induced defenses. It produces a cascade of chemicals that are meant to deter feeding. And that happens in any plant. And, uh, and you can see in a native host, lodgepole has a pretty good capacity for producing induced responses uh, following attack, not so much in white park pine, a naive host. Uh, take it to the next level, how much resin flow? Trees, when they're mass attacked, and you've probably seen this from southern pine beetle and other mass attacking bark beetles, they pitch out. And I should have put a picture on that because it's a pretty cool picture, but you can once again see that a, a native host is much more likely to attack or be able to pitch out more resin when mass attack relative to a naive host. And the third, like sort of bringing it up to a trophic level, this is uh, the Nasimus dubius, it's a natural enemy. Natural enemies, we now know, will respond to some of these induced plant defense chemicals that are induced by herbivory, and they'll actually use those as cues to find prey. It's actually kind of cool. It's almost like plants are call indirectly calling natural enemies to, to insects. And you can see that natural enemies just don't, res they respond pretty well to attack lodgepole pine as native host, but they don't respond as well. It's a different chemical signature, even though it's still the same beetle feeding on a pine, because it's, it's a different chemical signature. They don't readily attack it. They don't readily go after those same attack trees. So you really see different responses depending on whether they're attacking a native or a, not, or a, a native host or a naive host. Bringing it to an example that's maybe a little bit more close to home for many of you, particularly in the Midwest, is the gypsy moth. And we're, we're pretty familiar with gypsy moth. And it's a really good model system in that um, we know a lot about it. And here's some really good work by David Gray in the, in the uh, Canadian Forest Service, where he looked at just climatic suitability of gypsy moth based on how it can tolerate winters and so forth. And right away, I know it's a terrible scale, but the red area are areas that we consider to be climatically suitable. We're not considering host types or anything like that. We're just looking at climate. And the blue areas are areas where we believe are not to be climatically suitable. So right away, you see these areas up north that are pretty blue, some high elevation areas as well. Basically, it's too cold. They die over the winter. The egg masses just can't survive in the winter. Now, if you're thinking about retiring in Florida, don't worry. It's not too cold in Florida <laughs> for them to make it. It's actually not cold enough. So a lot of insects require a, a cue to terminate diapause. And they go into this hibernation mode in the winter, uh, and this is true of, of almost any insect, they require a cue. And for most insects, that cue is cold temperatures. So without that cold temperatures, the eggs don't basically kick back up. 
So you could collect an egg mass, for example, in August around here, stick it on your kitchen counter, assuming your house is heated, uh, they won't hatch until you stuck them in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks. Then they have that cue to break diapause. So as you think about this in terms of climate change, certainly if winters get warmer, you can see some climatic envelopes opening up up here because it's no longer getting the same kind of winter mortality. But you can also see climatic windows closing down here as some of these areas no longer get these kind of chilling periods. So you really think about climate change, you think of a rain shift. You don't think of just constant range expansion. I think that's what we're seeing now in the literature too. We're seeing shifts in species distributions. So back to gypsy moth, as many of you know, it's a, it's a well-documented species. There's a, there's a management program coordinated through uh, forest health protection, through Region 8, called a slow spread program. NA is involved in that as well. And it collects data. And uh, some of these data have revealed a pretty telling story. If we look at just range dynamics over a 12-year period, you see quite a bit of differences between the amount of the rate at which gypsy moth has spread uh, for example, comparing Wisconsin to some of these other regions. And some of these regions, particularly in this Midwest region, are pretty easily explainable by just lack of host type. Too many cornfields, so to speak. Uh, but some of these areas are a little bit more interesting, particularly as you go down and towards Virginia, which we've really seen uh, a retraction over a 20-year period. And it's not through any kind of management intervention at all. In fact, most of the management activities are up in Wisconsin, where it's actually been spreading pretty quickly. There's hardly any management down here. We don't, they don't need to manage it. It goes away on its own. So we looked at that. And if you look at that in the context of insect development, this is a typical insect development curve. And you can pretty much plug in any temperate species in the world and get the same kind of curve. Insect development, the developmental rate goes up with temperature to some sort of optimal point. In this case, it happens to be about 28 degrees centigrade change. And so we can kind of consider anything on this side of the curve being suboptimal. And insects have a really good tolerance for suboptimal temperatures. They can develop, so this is a very wide range over which they can develop. But you notice on the other end, we call this supraoptimal, it, go down, it goes down pretty quickly. Most temperate species, and that's why they're temperate species, have a greater tolerance for temperatures in this kind of range than they do at the high range. So they're actually quite sensitive to hot temperatures. So we looked at this data, particularly in this part of Virginia, in, in West Virginia. What we saw over a 20-year period, we saw a pretty good relationship between the rate of that of spread from one year to the next and the amount of temperature exposure above that optimal temperature. And as you get more and more optimal temperatures, and this is basically the optimum temperature plus one degree, plus three, plus five, this shows the exposure required to result in range stasis. And you can see how that goes down very, very quickly. And you can, so basically this blue line, if you were to draw this all the way over here, it intersects zero and it comes down here to about 10.3. So it doesn't require a lot of exposure at really, really hot temperatures to see a, a net, basically range stasis. And you can see how quickly you get an idea, or get an idea of the amount of, of range retraction in response to warm temperatures. So what can we say about that? Well, range shifts are more likely. And the reason for that is that you get maybe areas that open up in one end, whether it's, I, I said northern extent, you can also think of this in terms of elevation. Uh, but you can also see southern extents maybe having a negative relationship. And really, the, the thing, a, a really key message here, I think, is that even species that we would consider to be highly invasive, like gypsy moth, who that we sort of consider that a highly invasive species, they're still affected. They're not immune. So you can imagine what's going on in native species that are probably a little bit more poorly studied. Well, we talked a little bit, or I, I mentioned a little bit about outbreak frequency intensity with regard to the mountain pine beetle. Um, this is a trickier thing, and there's a saying in ecology that there's no, there's no such thing as an empty niche. Usually when something opens up, there's a niche open up, something invades. And there's a really neat study in northern Bavaria that kind of highlights that. And they looked at five different pine, these are native pine defoliators, and what they looked at was their severity and frequency of outbreaks in northern Bavaria. And what they saw, depending on the species, this particular one, and my Latin is terrible, I'm not going to try to pronounce any of these, but this particular one went up in frequency, but no net change in severity in terms of damage to the trees. This one went up in frequency, but actually caused less damage, very interestingly. This one had no change whatsoever. It <laughs> didn't really matter over the 20, 30 years where they looked at the climate signature. 
Uh, a fourth one went down in both directions. Less frequency became less severe. And uh, a fifth one, once again, higher frequency, no severity. So really, on a four-stand level, we had different species going up and down, depending on how they were responding to climate change. But uh, on a stand level, no net change in the amount of damage to that forest stand. Now, the great not known unknown here is these are all native species. So you input a non-native species, and you sort of change the dynamics quite a bit. But it was interesting to see that in terms of damage, we saw pretty, they, they pretty much saw no net change. So what can we say about that? Well, lots of variation. Uh, tremendous amount of variation in how species respond. Some are winning, some are losing. And we're starting to see that in other systems as well. Uh, and this one study, in the absence of anything else, non-native species uh, importation, that the winners may sort of offset the losers in terms of uh, resulting in little change over, over a certain scale. And once again, the big known, un known unknown is how native species will interact. Moving on to seasonality and volcanism. This is a really interesting thing because insects are really tied to climate. You know, when they're, when they're developing, they develop at, the, at a rate uh, dependent on temperature. If it's hotter, they're going to develop faster to at some point. If it's colder, they're going to develop slower. So there's been a lot of work going back 30, 40 years before, even we even, before people were even mentioning climate change. And so a lot of these studies looked at really direct effects. You know, higher temperatures, faster rates of development, if it's a species that goes through many generations a year, the result would be more generations per year. And you can see the, the agricultural implication there. If you're managing a certain corn pest and you have to deal with yet another generation towards the end of the year, it could be a problem. But the, the amount of generations that we see in insects, climate is an important driver of development rate, but it's not the only driver. Most insects, most insects that go through multiple generations per year, actually use what they call them long day species. They use photo period. And that is the trigger. Remember I talked about how a chilling period is a trigger for insects, many insects to break diapause? Photo period is the trigger for them to begin diapause. And photo period is not changing. I mean, it changes like 0. 0.00001 seconds per year or whatever, something like that. So it doesn't really matter um, if it's really hot in, say, November. They're already in diapause. It really comes down to um, what kind of temperatures are they exposed to before they hit that photo period, that fixed date in time, uh, where they're going to be triggered to go into diapause. And that's the real driver. How many degree day, we talk about degree day units, how many degree day units can you get before that critical photo period? And that's really the primary driver of generations in insects. Now, gen insects that are what we call univoltine go through one generation per year, they're different. They're genetically programmed to go through one generation a year. Gypsy moth is a good example of that. So here I'm talking about those ones that do go through many generations a year. And this is a study I did uh, a while ago. Uh, this is actually on a great berry moth, an agricultural pest. And I think it highlights this kind of phenomenon pretty well. You can see that if you look at accumulated degree days and the number of generations per year, there's a lot of degree day range where you don't really get another generation. You haven't generated enough degree days to push out another generation, even though you say, well, it's a lot hotter here than it is here. It is, but you get a really wide period of uh, range of stasis. At some point, it goes up pretty dramatically because it's been so hot and you've accumulated so many degree days that, you've able, that you're actually able to push out an entire different generation before you get to that photo period. And if you look at it in terms of a modeling scale, the same kind of phenomenon, if you don't really deviate that much, either negative or positive, from a 10-year mean, you don't really see that much difference in the number of generations per year. But you do get at some point on, on either end where it goes up much more dramatically, either fewer generations or a lot more generations. A good example in terms of the non-native species, so this, is, this is one of these insects that we've actually sent somewhere else. So we get a lot of insects that come in from other countries. We all know that. But we actually do our share of sending those out, too. So this is fall webworm. We all know what fall webworm is. We see it every fall. We just ignore it. Um, if you're growing up, you, maybe you burn some of these things. It's a really cool thing. I never did that. But some of you might have took me, set them on fire or whatever. But uh, uh, it's a native species. It's not a really big problem here. But it is a big problem in Japan because, once again, it's feeding on naive trees in Japan. And it was actually introduced in Tokyo in 1945. And I think we can all guess how it got there to Japan in 1945. It's probably on military freight. Um, and initially, 
it basically, much like a lot of regions in the U.S., it went through two generations per year, pretty much over its range. By 1960, they all were two generations per year. And they did, um, um, uh, Takehiko Yamanaka did a really nice study where what they've been finding in some of these areas highlighted by the gray arrows are actually seeing three generations per year. So here's a good example of a species that has, in certain regions, has been able to consistently get those degree day accumulations before whatever trigger diapause, getting a third generation per year. And it's causing a lot more management implications. Think about managing an insect population, and you're trying to manage your timing, your, your, your treatment to peak emergence. Now you're dealing with a third peak to deal with. So what can we say about that? Well, you know, like I said, most multi-generation insects use photoperiod. So that's actually a good thing for us. Um, but really what it comes down to is how warm is it before you get to that, that cue? So how many degree days can you get before that photo period kicks in? And even subtly, we talk about, you know, oh, big deal, it's one degree warmer. Is that really a big deal? Well, actually it is. Even really subtle differences over the course of a growing season can add up enough degree days to push out a different generation. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the trickier thing. And this, is, this has gotten a lot of... Uh, a lot of interest in ecological circles, this idea of, of how species are interacting and how those interactions may be affected by, by climate and changes in climate. And there's something, if you think about how insects, just consider insects and host plants. I'm just going to stick with two systems, but you can also imagine this dealing with host plants, insects, and their natural enemies. That's even more complex. So right now we're just going to deal with the two, the, the insects and the host plants. And, one thing that can occur is if you get uh, a climate event or a warming, a warming of a climate, you can imagine those distributions being shifted in time. And we've seen that. We've, we talk about, oh, the cherry trees are blooming a week earlier this year and two weeks earlier and so forth. And thanks. And, but insects, you, know, you would think insects are also coming out earlier too. So uh, anything that uses temperature to, in terms of you know, bud burst or insect hatch, you would see those, you would think those things would sort of shift, maybe in concert. We also think that there may be a system or a situation where one's responding slightly differently. So they're both shifting, they're both coming out earlier, but maybe one is coming out slightly earlier. And um, there are a few examples of this, I'm only going to go over one, but uh, before I get there, a lot of this talks, of, we, we talk about this, these rela relationships in context of what's known as the phenological window hypothesis. And it may sound like a, a, not a big deal. Like, think about gypsy moth. It eats over 300 host trees. Does it really matter if it's not perfectly lined up with one of the 300 trees it can eat? Well, actually, it, it, it can matter. Because of those 300 host species, only about 70 or so are preferred enough to be consumed by early hatching individuals. When insects grow up, so to speak, as larvae, as they get bigger and bigger, they become more tall. They're able to tolerate a wider range of host trees. But when they're little bitty guys, like neonates we call them, there's only a few different species they can exploit. On top of that, insects, as you, you guys have seen little caterpillars, you know, maybe you read The, uh, the Hungry Caterpillar, which is, I bring that up because I'm writing this paper and I was doing a, a literature review in Google Scholar on inter insects and diet, and like the fifth thing that came up was the Hungry Caterpillar by <laughs> So I'm trying to figure a way of working this into my paper and citing it, so I haven't figured that out yet. But um, when they're really small, and not only can they not tolerate many different kinds of host trees, but they also don't have the mouth parts to mechanically chew into the leaf. If you took a newly hatched gypsy moth that you were lab rearing and threw it on a mature oak leaf, it couldn't chew it. It doesn't have the mouth parts to chew into it. So it, it is kind of a critical thing. There's a really a finite window where a newly hatched caterpillar could take advantage of a particular leaf. It needs to be nice and soft and nice and tender and nice and new. Well, here's a really good study. This is a study in uh, actually in Fennoscandia, which is this part of uh, Finland, Norway, uh, Scotland, and the part of, of Russia. And uh, this is up at the University of Tromsø, which is all the way up at 70 degrees north latitude. I think it's the most northern four-year institution of higher learning in the world, uh, so they claim. Um, and this particular one it, it is another species that has expanded its northern range, and it's acting as a kind of a non-native species at this point. And initially, when they started moving up north, they just assumed like everybody else did. They're getting milder winters, 
They must be that they're able to survive these areas that they couldn't survive in before. When they looked at it in more detail, and Yanni Epson came up with a really nice paper a few years ago, but they realized what it was not a, there was not that strong climatic signature associated with that northward expanse. So they started looking at, well, what's it feeding on? Well, historically in this region, they've always had, and they can go back and, and, and get this out through you know, various data uh, sources and so forth. If you look at the distribution of birch hat, hatch, which is really the only tree you can eat up there, that's really the only subarctic birch is the only available host tree that far north. By the time uh, the eggs of this particular moth came out, there were you know, basically most of the birch had already leafed out. So there were very, very few of these new leaves that these neonates could, could eat. So that's historical. What have they seen? Well, as you would expect, they've seen birch coming out a little bit sooner. No big deal. And it's sort of shifted. But the insect has shifted at a greater rate. So now, in this region, most of these uh, eggs are hatching almost in sync with peak leaf out of birch. So really, yes, climate had a lot to do with it, and they're certainly uh, able to survive milder winters, but it really was the fact that they became more synchronized with their only available host tree because of their differential response to climate warming. I think I just said all that, <laughs> but anyway. So, what can we say about that? Well, difficult to generalize. Every system is different. Um, we're dealing with uh, challenges just looking at two species. There's a lot of studies right now on host, plant, and insects. What about natural enemies? How are they responding? We don't know. It's just a very complex problem. Um, in some cases, we've seen plants and insects becoming more asynchronized, and sometimes they're more synchronized. I mentioned a little bit the phenological window hypothesis. It, it's actually a pretty contentious hypothesis just because um, it, it's tough to come up with some sort of broad generalization. And it certainly has maybe more play with insect specialists, those insects that can only eat maybe one or two things. But um, I think most people recognize that certainly under the right conditions, it can play a pretty important role. 